Okay, welcome everyone to the fourth part of our introduction to the world of Musser. We're going to finish off last week's topic. And thank you everyone for adjusting their schedules to, uh, to be here tonight. And I appreciate that. And if anyone, as I mentioned, if anyone wants to turn their videos on, if they're able to, um, I think it adds a lot, but I totally understand if you can. Thank you everyone who has their videos on. Um, thank you. Okay, so we were discussing at the end of our shir last week, the debate, the Pulmas Hamusr, the, those who did not accept the approach of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, of Navardic, who questioned the validity of the introduction of a new body of study into the yeshiva curriculum. Namely, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, and he really came from that same world, as we'll soon see, of Rav Chaim Volozhner and the Vilna Gom. As expressed by Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, as often referred to in the Yeshiva University circles as the Rav, he's the one who formulates this position in Halakhic Man, as we were discussing last time. But it's really not his own innovative innovation. It's really coming from a long Masora in the Salvatic dynasty in the world of Brisk, that nothing needs to be added to the Torah for it to be impactful, for it to elevate a person's spiritual horizons. If one's healthy, remember that uh, the castor oil uh, um, mushal that Rev Salvatic gave that he said, if you're sick and you have castor oil or whatever medication we're, you know, compared to today, then you could be better, you, you could be cured. But for us healthy people in Volajin, we say to, to, the, uh, to the Musarniks, to the people from Kovna and from Kelm, let them eat their, uh, I, forgot the, I forgot the exact quotation, uh, let, the, you know, eat, let them eat their... Um, Whatever I, I have only oh I have the, the actual citation here. Sorry, let's just quote it accurately. If the scholars of Kelm and Kovna feel compelled to drink bitter drugs, let them drink to their heart's content, but let them not invite others to dine with them. And with that, we will we will continue in the position of the, the Soloveitchik dynasty, um, I'll drop the, the source sheet again in the chat just in case anyone just came. This is from last week. We're just finishing off and then we'll just start tonight. We'll be a focus on Slobodka. So in source number six, Rav Soloveitchik expresses this ideal and this ambitious picture of what Limera Torah, what it's about and why, in fact, his, uh, grand, his father and his grandfather, Rav Moshe Soloveitchik and Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, actually discouraged the excessive or even, we may even consider the uh, normative recitation of Tehillim. So let's read this story together and you'll understand why they were insulted and incensed at the suggestion that anything needed to be added to the study of Talmud Torah. So about like uh, seven or eight lines down from source number six is in Halakhic Man. Halakhic Man, on the contrary, is very sparing in his recitation of the piyutim, talking about, you know, to chinos or to hillim, not heaven forbid on account of philosophical qualms. Not like we doubt that it's from Shemayim or that it's authentic, no. But because he serves his maker with pure halakhic thought, precise cognition and clear logic. He does not waste his time reciting songs and hymns. Again, understand the context here. Rav Salvejic is not saying there's, it's purposeless. It just, he's trying to make a point. And those who argued for Musr and those who argued for a relationship with Hashem as the primary focus, he's saying we, the halakhic man doesn't have time to sit around and saying to Hillam, the cognition of the Torah, this is the holiest and the most exalted type of service. He serves the creator by uncovering the truth in the halacha, by solving difficulties and resolving problems. Now, this is the story which, just to understand this, we have to, again, have that background knowledge that there's this focus and this purity of intention that the brisk approach 
assumes and embraces. And that focus is Talmud Torah at the highest level, the highest level of totally immersed in hours and hours of study and, and, and at full throttle. So here, take a, take a look at this story. Once my father entered the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, late in the afternoon, after the regular prayers were over, you see, they had a break. Back even, even on Salvinchik's day, they had a break. So he, he comes in and he sees him, finally reciting psalms with the congregation. Gets people out of Minna to say, you know, the Shiro, so they said to heal him together. And what did Rav Soloveitchik do? His father, Rav Moshe, what did he do? He said, take that to heal him. Put it away. He took my away my psalms and handed me a copy of the tractate Rosh Hashanah. Give me a, a Mesechus Rosh Hashanah. And he said the following, if you wish to serve the creator at this moment, better study the laws pertaining to the Chag, to the festival. While the congregation would recite Piyutim on the days of awe, the Yom Nerah and Rav Chaim, would study Torah. This is, again, the same tradition that the way to access that special um, connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is by learning the Torah, by be fully immersed in Torah. I'm going to skip down to the, the beginning of the last sentence here. And this is a very famous um, principle in Rav Chaim Belashin's worldview. And it's what Dr. Norman Lamb actually um, wrote a, a work called Torah Lishma. And if I'm not mistaken, it was his it was his dissertation, but I have to check that. But either way, he has a work called Torah Lishma. It's on the print, the approach of Rav Chaim Belajan to learning Torah for its own sake. So here's here's this idea: the whole notion of Torah Lishma for its own sake, the end of the of the six swords, is primarily refers to study for the sake of the love of Torah, that one should exert oneself to determine the root principle of the law. But a person may think that lishma means for the sake of cleaving to God, of dveikus, which he's you know, um, articulating as a contrast to the Hasidic approach. Some say it was the Balatanya, some say it was uh, the, the Tanya, some say it was other works, but he's in contradistinction to that approach. He says, no, if it was just doing uh, j- just dveikus, so let the person say to Helen, let the person daven. What's the purpose of, da- of learning specifically? So he says, that's not the approach of Torah Lishma. The primary purpose, skipping down ten, about 10 lines, the, this is so because the primary purpose of study is not to sim- study simply for the sake of cleaving to God, the Vekas, but to comprehend through the Torah, the commandments and laws, and to know each and every matter clearly, both in its general principles and its particulars. And the last line over here, thus, even though at the time of study, a person does not have the fear of God in mind, He's not thinking about Hashem. He's trying to figure out what the Gemara is saying. He's trying to figure out what the halacha is. Nevertheless, the study itself is for the sake of the unification of the Holy One, blessed be He. And if he exerts himself, he says, the certain the Shechina that rests upon him at the very moment of his studying, as the sages have stated, God only has in his world, in this world, the four cubits of the halacha. V'dalad amos shahalacha. And this is Rav making a point right here, the last three sentences. The above is a declaration of Rav Chaim Velazhin, the outstanding student of the Gona Vilna, and the founder of the Yeshiva Velazhin. And it would appear to me that it needs no comment. In other words, if you're doing a cross-examination in a court, and the, they got the witness, the key witness, to totally, you know, uh, to misspeak, and it's clear to everyone, that the, the lawyer says, no further questions, Your Honor. It's over. End of discussion. So there is a discussion. I don't mean to argue with Rizal but I think as we've seen in the past three, um, three uh, shiurim, three pieces of this lecture series, there is a different approach, obviously. And we, we understand that, and we don't mention this last time, it's possible that, that Rav Chaim Velazhin's uh, you know, approach and the approach of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik may have been good for the the students in Brisk and Velazhin were learning at the highest levels, but perhaps for the Hamonam, the general public, they needed sort of an inspiring, fresh, new approach, uh, a moral approach focusing on ethics. We discussed that last time. I, I want to share with you another criticism of the Muslim movement from coming from, from, for those uninitiated, and I was not initiated into this until fairly recently, coming from an unusual source, the Chazanish. Now, the Chazan Ish, if you, know, you have a, any previous knowledge of the Chazan Ish, we know of the Chazan Ish, of Avram Yishai Karelitz, who founded 
pretty much the Torah community of B'nai Brak as a fiery machmir. And those students of the Chazanish, they don't rely on Rav Shlomo Zalman's kulos for electricity on Shabbos and all the chumras of B'nai Brak. And we think of the Chazanish as this, you know, um, this staunch traditionalist who is not in any way sensitive to the reality uh, or the more, we could say, the more broad uh, experience of the soul. And nothing could be f- further from the truth. However, you have to look at his, uh, I would say it's an essay, really. It's a little, tiny little safer. I'll show you. I actually have it over here. It's called Emuna Ubitachon. And this is a little work where right away you see the Chazanish in a, a completely different light. His Hebrew is impeccable and poetic. It talks about just this overwhelming sense of seeing God and nature, and it's, it's just an unbelievable, an unbelievable work. And I want to focus on the third and fourth prakim. We don't have time to do all of, uh, you know, the, the entire treatment, but in the third parak, the Chazen Ish, really, uh, and I think part of it was censored, um, goes out on a limb and starts to criticize the proponents of a certain view of bitachon. That's why the work is called Emuno bitachon. And we mentioned last time the approach of bitachon of Nevardic. Nevardic, we understood last time, was Nevardic is the more you believe, the better things will go. And if you don't believe enough, then believe more. And we said part of the Nevardic approach was that if HaKadosh Baruch Hu can do anything, then he can do anything. So what, what, am, I, what am I worried about? But the Chazanish took issue with this. And he we'll see that he probably had more in common with the Musser Nicks, with the, those who approached Musser um, and in, in, implemented a focus on ethical works. He probably had a lot more in common with them than those who, who, uh, who were part of the Pomus of Musser, the organized opposition to Musser. However, there was still a critique that he was leveling at the Musser movement in, in different ways. And uh, it could be he wanted to finesse and wanted to, to uh, influence the Musser movement. He wasn't coming to attack it. But he, we have his words, and I want to just read a few a few words with you together. So source number seven, this is in the source sheet. I'm going to drop it again in the chat for those who joined us recently. And source number seven, Amuno Bitachon. This is from Parak Bays, actually. I just want to read a little piece of it. So he writes the following. Tos Noshenes is Azkara believe Rabim Musa Bitachon. There's a mistake that is um, commonly found in people's hearts when it comes to the idea of bitachon. And he says, people believe, mikra, I'm skipping a few lines, anything that happens to a person. And there's two, and there's, it's not clear which outcome will occur. And there's two possibilities of what will happen. You have one that's good and not the second. He says the, the mistake is if he has trust, things will be good. If he's in doubt and he thinks about what maybe the other side of the, the, the occurrence, the other possibility, the other permutation, what will happen? He starts worrying about it. Who That is a lack in bitachon. What is this? What does this sound like? I can't prove it to you, but I've heard those who want to contend. This is a not even a veiled critique. It's a critique of sort of the form of of the bitachon that Navardic promulgated. In fact, the stipler who was very close to the Chazanish. He learned in the Navardic yeshivas, and uh, he was a big one of the big leaders of the Navardic movement. I don't know of any. I don't have any. Uh, I didn't find any discussion where they just they go back and forth about it. But he came from that world. It's possible he's also, you know, he's also uh, critiquing a more Hasidic approach of bitachon, and he continues and writes as, uh, it further in this parak base that he he really now is not the time to go in through his entire approach to bitachon. But he writes, and this is important for a general understanding of the of the bitachon that the Chazanish embraces. He says, "Ki ein kan the fun of shum ra miyada mikra." Person cannot nothing negative can happen to a person. From by chance. Raka kol mi ito It only comes from him, from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, bein latov, bein lamuta. So it doesn't matter. The way he's framing it is that it could be that something's going to happen bad to you. 
That's part of bitachon. Part of bitachon is knowing that it's not that only things that are good are going to happen to the Baal Bitochon, to someone who has faith. It's the person who has faith understands that whatever the outcome, Hashem wants this to be occurring to me in my life. And this is something that I personally, I mentioned to you before that I had trouble understanding the Nevada approach and I, I, I think maybe I'm not the best spokesperson for it. This resonates much more with me in my chinuch uh, and my upbringing. That bitachon doesn't mean everything's going to be good, everything's going to work out, and if it doesn't, you don't have enough bitachon. Bitachon means knowing that a Kaddish Baruch Hu could do anything, obviously, but if something happens to me in my life that's not good, negative, that also comes from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Now, the eighth source is an article I, I just found by Lawrence Kaplan. Lawrence Kaplan is a Talmud of Rav Soloveitchik. He translated Halachic Man, and he has a very nice piece which I put, picked some of it up from, he t- has a nice piece on the Chazanish. Interesting. He calls it the Chazanish, a uh, Haredi critic of traditional orthodoxy. And the Chazanish, this is a translation of a piece also in Unumunu Bitachon. And the Chazanish t- takes issue with another form of the Musr exercises that some of the Musrniks, specifically Nevardic, underwent. We mentioned this last time, that Nevardic would go and they would place themselves in situations that would test their faith. They would go or even test their midos. They would go into a store. They would embarrass themselves. They would go into wealthy men, that, wealthy people, men and women, whatever, people who had money. And they would specifically dive in completely loud and in your face. And the, 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 the gvirim and the people who supported the yeshivas were like, this is disgusting. You're, you're so, it's disrespectful. And they would just go into someone's house and start davening mincha, mincha, mincha. And they would just make a whole show of it to show we don't care what a rich person is going to say about us because we are working on our sense of, of you know, independence. And they would go through these different tests. They would, they would go out and again, start yeshivas without any money, just a chavos of the bavos and a little coat. You know, you're the mashkiach, here's your chavos of the bavos. You're the rosh yeshiva, here's your coat. Go start a yeshiva. So the chazanish takes issue with these sort of pu'ulos, they called them. Pu'ulos were these actions, these musar exercises to test oneself to improve their character traits. So he writes, and this is in source number eight in the, um, the citation on, between the paragraphs. He writes explicitly, this is a quote, uh, translation and a citation of the Chazanish. A person should not seek out trials in order to train himself in the rectific, rectific, rectification of his character traits. On the contrary, it is an ethical obligation to avoid a situation in which one might be subject to a trial. So you see this again, this, this common theme within the, the Chazanish's writings that he just took issue with sort of these new fangled we'll call them exercises or different approaches that was going around. And he was saying, no, we don't ask for nisyonos. We don't ask for trials. We do what a Baruch Hu says, and you work on your midos in that framework. Obviously, the Chazanish was not saying you shouldn't work on yourself. He wasn't saying you shouldn't you know, develop, as we noted in Munavi Tachon, he has this very, very, um, he talks about adinos, this sense of um, any translation is going to fall short of adinos, but this you know, um, delicate nature uh, and, and pure and, and he, the refined soul worked on a Muna. And he's, he's definitely like in that same world, just a different strategy. We're not going to make ourselves, you know, uh, put ourselves through these pu'ulos to try to work on ourselves. We're going to do it within the normal framework of life. We're not going to make ourselves crazy. We're not going to look strange. Now it should be noted. And this is a, a adaption from the Kovitz uh, Igro, Igaro, Igros uh, Chazanish. This is also from the same article, same source. And it should be noted that Rav, the Chazanish is, is uh, quoted as saying, and it's in his own letters, that he had more in common with the Musarniks than the opponents of Musar, as I mentioned earlier. And here I just want to read a few lines from it where he says it explicitly. He referring to Rav Yerucham Lubavitz, the Mashkiach of the Mir Yeshiva, as I mentioned, a student of the Kelm. Uh, school and Rav Nassim Finkel, the author of Slabadka, he spent time with them. And he writes, a boundless love always existed between us and they were completely devoted to me. Never would I refrain. Okay, please repost. Here we go. This is from last week, but I will repost it. Thank you for asking, Shmuel. Okay. So he says that a boundless love always existed between himself, the Chazanish, and the uh, proponents of the Muslim movement. And he said, that I always um, 
I would not refrain from leveling a sharp critique of the various Musa ideologies. There we have it. It says it out, it says it out, right? And they delighted in this because of true scholars delight more in attempted refutations of their views than they do in the support of being adduced in favor of their positions. They liked it. They got a gishmak out of, you know, the Chazanish shepherding them and, 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 and pushing them and saying, I don't agree. And they, they enjoyed it. They, they, they felt, uh, you know, informed and enlightened by the, con- by the, um, by the contrast and by the challenge. And then he writes over here at the end that what is my friend? They, they, they asked him, why are you coming to the altar, altar of Slabodka's Musa Shmuz? And he says that, that it should be known that uh, I, he says, yes, I'm opposed to Musa, but he says, I'm an even more opposed to your opponents. So we see that the Chazanish, although he took issue with the Musa movement, it was not this sort of, um, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. He had certain critiques, certain issues he had with it, but, uh, but he thought that the people who, didn't want to, you know, encourage any ethical um, influences or ethical curriculum. He definitely did not agree to that. Um, moving on, there's another thing, which uh, another issue that I'm going to just touch briefly on, and that is again the same idea which we saw in the Brisker uh, ideology, and that is the focus on Musser study at the expense of Limera Torah, pure, you know, Talmud Torah, Gemara, Mishnayis, and those in, the, in that form. So the, the Chazanish writes that we have to remember that, and this is in source number nine, right in the beginning, that halachahiyya machras as ha'asr as a mutter shal Torah sa musr. We saw that there were people who were creating sort of this new world of thought, different ideology. And he was saying at the end of the day, the Torah, the halacha is what determines what's usr and what's mutter, shall Torah samusr, of the ethical realm. In other words, whatever is okay halachically is going to have to be okay in musr as well, because you, you, you can't create a new, a new ideology, a new philosophy that will in any way counter or contradict halacha. Now, there is an idea of the Fnimishur Hadin. Many people raise this objection. What do you mean? Halacha is the only thing that matters. There are degrees. So I'm not going to get involved in, in that entire discussion. But at the end of the day, the Chazanish is making a point. He was worried about certain trends in the, in the Muslim world of redefining what should be done, and what's correct, and what's usher, and what's mutter in a different framework, outside of the framework of halacha. And he says, no, 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 no. You could have ethical works, you could have study of ethical works, but you can't forget that at the end of the day, the halacha is central. And that's similar, similar from a different angle than what Rav Chaim Soloveitchik and Rav Chaim Velazhina were saying, in, that quoted and presented in the, the halachic man, is that in any, if you in any way imply that the Torah is insufficient, the Talmud Torah can get kulam. Talmud Torah is, is, is everything. So you can't argue that there's anything wrong or anything mistaken with a curriculum that is completely Torah-centered. And the Chazanich makes this even more clear in Yud-Bez, Yud Bez and Os Yud Gimel in the same Parak Gimel. So this is in source number 10. I'll begin with Os Yud Aleph. This, there are people that from their very young age they're involved in working on themselves and learning this these svarim. But they don't learn halacha. They don't learn mishpat. They're not going to acquire the love of mishpat. In other words, you're working on yourself. You're working on your midos. You're doing mesilas uh, yisharim. You're le- you know you're learning to try to work on gaiva. Did you learn what it says in Choshe Mishpat? Did you learn what the problems of stealing are and what the details of ribis are and interest? If you didn't, he says, Hema. Uh, he says, um, I want to I want to make sure that this is um, want to make sure that this is the right translation. I'll tell you in a second. I have a translation. I. Got a piece of it here. These people, he says, are more susceptible. They're more susceptible 
to the moral illness of perversion of justice than those simple people who have not studied the matters of fear of God and the ways of perfecti- perfecting one's traits. Right? They're even he's, he's saying that there's more of a risk of them not having the proper midos. Hema, that's a fuyim hema lechali shal avos hadin. They're more susceptible of, of, you know, making this wrong accounting in halacha or in 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 in, in, in judgment. Yosem Eva had yotim to the lamdu asamusar a year about Torah samidos. Someone who never learned, to, you know, tikkun amidos, never worked on their on themselves, but they know they, they they've not blurred the line between halacha and musar. Those people are safer. That's a very large. That's a very strong statement. He's again pointing out that, that at the end of the day, halacha is what defines what's moral, and not 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 the uh, working on our midos. So if you want to really understand how Chosh Mishpat works, how we want to inculcate and build a love of Torah Hashem, that's the way to do that is through the study of Chosh Mishpat itself. And he writes Kfar Gila Had. Hagon Rabbi Yisrael Salanter Zetzal, this is in Yud Beis, Be'igraso, in his Igeras HaMusser, he writes, Ki'im Amnam Kavanasim Ritsuya, even if people have good intentions, Ma'aseyem Mikulkalim Tachas HaKilpum, their deeds are totally bad, completely bad, completely corrupted. Ki'mil Shelo Amma Bahalacha Be'iyan Hadak, someone who does not labor over learning Halacha in great depth, he doesn't know the value of the halacha. And its ways will be hidden from him. And you lack the fundamentals of serving Hashem. He tells us to what? To observe the sifim, to observe the, um, the, the uh, actual practical halachas. But it, he also tells us we have to love the mishpat, love the concept of justice. Now, what is, again, what is the Chazanish saying here? He's saying that if you don't spend the time, the effort it takes, and he's almost implying that, and we'll get to this, there's a, a dispute even that come up to this very day about sort of the sugarcoating of working on yourself and working on Midos feels that it, it's almost like an escapes to, from doing that hard laboring over the Gemara and the Rashi and the Tosis. And he says, if you really want to know how to build that love of, of, of Mishpat, of Halacha, is you learn Halacha. That's what you do. And, and then he says a, a very, very, very sharp line over here again. What good are his perfect traits, which he so prides himself when his hands are soiled with constant, they translate as larceny and daily stealing. If you don't know halacha, he's arguing you're going to make mistakes. You're going to unfortunately steal from people. And how can you tell me you're working on your midos when you don't even know what is halachically a, a, you know, a good business contract or what's ribis? How can you argue that this you know, uh, you know, this agreement you made is, is okay when you don't even know what the Allah says. And last, I'll just read the English translation here for time's sake. He again emphasizes this focus, as we saw in Rav Soloveitchik's work in Halachic Man, the focus of learning Gemara, Rashi, Tosfis, and not focusing on uh, uh, ethical works. He says one of the main ways to reflect one's love of justice is to learn Gemara, Rashi, and Tosfis regarding Allah's in general. And halachas pertain to the laws between man and man. Bin Arum Lachavir, in particular, as Rabbi Saul Salanter said, Rabbi Saul Salanter often would encourage people to learn Choshe Mishpat, to learn halachas Bin Arum Lachavir, because that's what deepens your knowledge and your love of the uh, principles of Bin Arum Lachavir is by is by learning those halachas. And at the end, just the last piece, if one neglects the halacha and has not put an effort to learn it, there's no doubt. That he is lacking in justice and danger of becoming an unwitting accomplice to an evil enemy. So we see very clearly the Chazanish is arguing for a different model than the typical Musar approach. Although, as we noted, 
he did say he has more in common with the Musraniks than the opponents, but he did feel that it was necessary to pen these, these critiques. It, there was a whole dispute when it was published. Did he really want it to be published? He, did he write it for himself? It's not so clear. But at the end of the day, the Chazin Ish has, I would say, three, we've seen three different critiques, just to summarize. Number one, he critiqued the sort of, the, the, the bitachon, the view that anything that happens negatively is a lack of bitachon, anything you have more bitachon, things will go well. He disputed the practice of pu'ulos, of trials, of, of taking on different sort of, I would call them absurd. They were, you know, intentionally absurd trials to work on your midos. And number three, he encouraged, similar to the risk approach and the velazhin approach, he encouraged the focus on learning halacha in depth and in eon. And although the briskers and the chazanish have a long history of disputes, the going all the way back to the Gilionos that Chazanish wrote on Reb Chaim Sefer on the Rambam. We're not going to get into that, but they did agree on this point that they agree that the focus should be Limera Torah. The focus is to be this purity of, uh, of, of delving into the halacha, not worrying about Tikan Amidos, but getting to Tikan, it seems to be getting to Tikan Amidos through the halacha. And it's interesting that the Chazanish quotes Rabbi Yisrael Salantra, so he's really arguing that Rav Yisrael's teachings are sort of being filtered through their students and not being properly understood. But Rav Yisrael Salantar himself told people, you want to learn Musr, you should learn Choshen Mishpat. You want to learn how to become a better person, you should learn the Halachos of Bin al Machavira. So between the, the, the laws that pertain to man and man. So it's almost like a, uh, you know, it's an anti musr but musr approach because he is taking the sort of assumptions of the Muslim movement that there's a problem that we're trying to solve and we need to work on ourselves. He's looking at it at, you know, trying to, uh, a different strategy. Whereas Rav Khan Velazhar said, you know, we're not sick, so we don't need this stuff. Chazanish is saying, we need it, but we're doing it in a different way and we're trying to accomplish it through the study of Torah. So that's um, a brief survey of the, I would say, the... Uh, the Pulmas HaMusr, the organized opposition to the Muslim movement, although I don't know if they, I don't know if the Chazanish would see himself as an opponent of Musr. I think for sure Reb Chaim Velazhner probably did see himself as that, or Reb Chaim Soloveitchik. We're going to move on to our uh, fourth part of our lecture series, which is the school of Slabarka. So I'm going to post a new, um, I'll open the floor for questions if anyone wants to ask about that. And then we'll move on to, I'll post a new source sheet in the chat. Does anyone want to discuss for a moment? We, there was a lot mentioned, a lot of different things that we want to discuss the opposition to the Muslim movement. Um, what's Hoshin Mishpat? Hoshin Mishpat is the, um, one of the sections of the Shulchan Aruch, um, of the laws pertaining to uh, biz business and damages between things that you know occur between people damages and things that um of that nature and and actually rabbi karabkin actually has a choshen mishpat chabura that he learns it every morning financial uh things ribis interest you know problems mm -hmm. basically ethical ethical fi financially Focusing on fin finances and ethical uh, halacha. And um, how, I apologize, they, I should have translated that. How do they feel about women and what they should be learning? So, right. I'm going to get to specifically that question probably next time. I did mention, I think I think I mentioned it in one of the one of the pieces that Rabbi Yisrael Salantar encouraged women to learn Musr. Um and it, it, it wasn't at this point in the uh, in the history, the women learning, you know, Gemara or Halacha at a high level was not even on the table yet. It, 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 you know, the Beis Yaakov movement wasn't even founded until, uh, you know, Sarah Schneer's time. So we're really even pre Beis Yaakov. Um, so Rav Yisrael was very for, he had a lot of foresight and he talks about the women, you know, needing to learn. But it didn't. It really didn't get off the ground until until Sarah Schneer. Okay, 
So I, 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 I dropped the fourth packet, which is the packet on Slabodka. Now, if you take a look, there's a few pictures that I just, I, that I included here, which I feel are just uh, essential to get a feel for the world of Slabodka. Now, Slabodka, as I mentioned to you, had influence on per, possibly almost all of the yeshivas, especially North America, post-war. Um, and it's a very, it's, it's per, personally, I feel very connected to it. I spent time in the mirror. I learned by Rav Aaron Lopiansky, who is the son-in-law of Rabbi Finkel. And there's a lot of overlap in a lot of yeshivas. There was a lot of influence that the yeshivas in America, in North America, and in Israel, are, there's a lot of influence on them from the, the world of Slavatka. So you see in the, in the first page, just this regal um, man, uh, this appearance of regality of the of Nassim Tzvi Finkel, the altar of Slabadka. Underneath those pictures, you can see the stylish Bachrim, the, 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 the immaculately dressed Slabadka students. In the middle, sitting with his arms folded like this, is a young Rav Yitzchak Hutner with an up hat and a tie. And there was an, emph uh, an emphasis placed on external appearances, when many people saw the uh, many people saw the students of yeshivos as these nebuchs, uh, low lives, raggedy, you know, the, for, for sure Navardic, they would they wouldn't, you know, wearing a suit like this in Navardic, you probably would get laughed out of town. But the Slabodka, they they took and the altar walked around with the cane, and the cane was sort of a fashion statement. Maybe he needed it, but for sure the rabbis had these canes, and back in the day, it was it was considered a fashionable thing to do. And he wanted to encourage the bachram to feel good about themselves, to feel that they, you know, just as the university students dressed in a, in this way, we, you know, we want to we want to feel the covetous. We want to feel good about ourselves, and that was part of his emphasis on building up his students. And none, then of the had, class, none of them had beards. Right, right. Many of the Litvish yeshivas, they didn't have beards, but specifically in um, specifically in Slabarka, you could see in this picture, you don't you see that they don't have beards. And there's a little painting, it was a little small little wooden building in the, in, in a little off the beaten track town, a little uh, suburb of Kovna in Slabarka. You go over this little bridge and you would enter into a different world, into the world of Slabodka. And as I mentioned, I want to I want to talk about just a few of the students that came out of Slabodka. It's just unbelievable to see the list of the alumni of the yeshiva in Slabodka, which was called Knesset Yisrael. It's almost like a who's who of the early to mid 20th century Ashkenazic yeshiva world. So we have Rav Eliezer Yehuda Finkel, who was the son of the altar and became, he opened the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. Rav Yitzchak Hutner, we mentioned before, studied in Slabarka, and then he started Yeshiva Sechaim Berlin in Brooklyn and in Pachet Yitzchak in Eretz Yisrael. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky studied in, in, uh, in Slabarka, and he founded Yeshiva Torah Vedas. Rav Yaakov Weinberg, and Rav Avram Leo Kaplan, the two rectors of the Heldesheim Rabbinical Seminary, studied in Slavarka. Rav Aaron Cutler, the Rosh Hashiva, the preeminent Rosh Hashiva and founder of BMG, based Manager Gavo in Lakewood. Rav David Leibowitz, Yeshiva's Chavetz Chaim, Rav Yaakov Yitzchak Bruderman, Ner Yisrael, Rav Yitzchak Sarna, Chevron, Meir Chodesh, another Chevron, Rav Yitzchak Isaac Sher, Slavarka and Bnei Brak, Rav Victor Miller, the Mashkiach of Yeshiva University, Rav Yaakov Moshe Lesson, the, one of the first mashkichim in Yeshiva University. All these people, it's just unbelievable to think that they all came out of Slabaka out of a certain golden period, about the end of the, at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, 20 or 30 years we're talking. And all these, all these figures were, came out of, of, of Slabaka and a tremendous, tremendous diversity. You have, you know, an academic, like Rav Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, you have 
Ravar and Color, the fiery traditionalist who started, you know, again, Torah Lishma in America. There's, we're not a rabbinical seminary. We're just learning. We're just sitting up Kolel. We, you know, you have Rav Hutner who became sort of a, you know, a, a, a Rebisha Rosh Yeshiva. It started sort of a Hasidish feel to the yeshivas. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. I mean, you have so many different facets. And we're going to talk about what was Slobodka's secret? We'll back up to a little bit of the story of it. But I just wanted to show you why it's so important, such a linchpin of our community today. Um, Nehra Yisrael, you know, all these, so many institutions find their roots in Slavaka. What was the secret? How did the altar in a small wooden building, undistinguished, as we mentioned, in a suburb of Kovno, create such and produce such giants of such diverse approaches? So, the altar was complicated. The altar was complicated and mysterious. We would probably find the answer if we could really understand who he was. The challenge is he was completely hidden. He, his, his, his mahus, his very essence was to hide himself. He was only there to train and to, and to um, assist his students. He didn't write any works. He didn't show his, uh, his godless in, in, in learning, his greatness in, in Torah study. He kept it all very hidden. And much of what we have today are just bits and pieces. We have two works that are recording, are, are, you know, recordings of, not recordings, audio recordings, but written works, written recordings of his shmuzin that were written down by his students. One is called Or HaTzafun, and one is called the Sichos Mi Saba Misalbatka. But, but n- neither of them written by him. And we'll see there's sort of challenges in learning them because they're just um, recordings of his schmoozing, which had their own unique, their schmoozing, a schmooze, we'll talk about what that is. It's a, an ethical discourse. They have their own unique type of style and there's a challenge in, in really even understanding them. But let's go through as much as we know and as much as possible in the time that we have who the altar was. So Rav Nassim C. Finkel, known when he was younger as Rav not the, uh, not Rav, but not the Hirsch, was born in 1849, and he passed away in 1927. And really all we know is he was born to Moshe Finkel, and his parents died at a very young age. He was raised by his uncle. And we have a letter that Rev. Alexander Moshe Lapidus, who was the rabbi of, his, of this little town in, I think it's pronounced Razin, not like Razin, like the Hasidic one, but Razin. And he was, we have a letter that, that this Rev. Lapidus writes um, to the altar of Kelm, as we mentioned, the first, uh, no, the second, the second uh, lecture that the the altar of Kelm was sort of the beginning of the Musar uh, yeshiva, and he there is Rav Lapidus writes a letter to the altar of Kelm about this little young Nata Hirsch, and immediately he sends him to to Kelm, and and a relationship is formed, and he takes to this little this the Nata Hirsch. And Rav Simcha Zissel Ziv, the author of Kelm, tutors him and, 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 and molds him and creates this leader. At a certain point, they had a differences of opinion, had a, had a, had a run uh, the yeshiva, it seems. We don't know so much about it. And Rav, Rav Nassim C. Finkel begins at the age of 28 in 1877 to start fi- founding his own institutions. And as I mentioned to you, the word altar doesn't, com- doesn't necessarily come along with age. It does mean elder, but the, they, in 19, in, in, at the age of 32 in 1882, the altar found, he founds Slo- the Slobodki Yeshiva, and he's referred to as the altar. He was only 32 years old. Um, so a person of tremendous abilities, and obviously at a young age was able to Institute, you know, create institutions and create a movement and attract students in a way that was unfounded, unseen before. So, moving just quickly, there was a, eventually a split in 1897 in Slabarka, and there was a, a group of anti Muslims that basically rebelled. And this was a theme throughout the history of both Tells and Slabarka. There were different factions within the yeshivas, and there were often these periods of rebellion. And in 1897, they actually split. And there were two yeshivas in Slavatka. One was called Knesset Beis Yitzchak, 
named after Rav Yitzchak Achan Inspector, who had just passed away. And the other was called Knesset Space Yisrael, as we mentioned, named after Rav Yisrael Salanter. Rav Baruch Ber Leibowitz gave Shear in Knesset Space Yitzchak, and the Knesset Space Yisrael was, was the students that we decided to decide and to, to continue studying with the altar of Slabarka. What's interesting is that in all of the, the, the um, descriptions of these in the accounts of this rebellious stage, they all talk about the altar as waiting out in the storm, speaking with students, not losing his calm, insisting on his derech. He always insisted on his derech. He was a very, you can see sort of this theme in, in, in some of the students. Rav Hutner was a similar personality of when he thought he was right, there was no, nothing to discuss. He felt he was right, and then he felt he should continue his approach. Eventually, things died down, and the, his following continued to, to stay with him, and there was a different yeshiva that was found. It does appear that Rav uh, Nassim Finkel, by the way, not to be confused with his great-great-great-grandson, Rav Nassim Finkel, who was the previous Rosh Hashiva, the Mir Yeshiva, they are related, and he was named after him, but different people. So Rav Nassim Svi Finkel, the author of Slabanka, eventually does seem to change his approach somewhat. It's not clear if his approach was changed because of this big rebellion, or he just generally felt there was a difference. We saw murmurings of this in um, Rav Soloveitchik's, uh, you know, in his critique of the Muslim movement, that in later years, Rav Yeruchim Lubavitz got involved, and there was more of a maturity in approach, and they focused less on sort of the day of death and, you know, and, and the, the pining over our sins. So there seems to be, and this is also found in the, in, in the students and the historians of the Muslim movement, there seems to be a shift later on in the author's approach to a more emphasizing the positive and emphasizing godless ha'adam. Godless ha'adam, if you want to summarize all of Slabarka into two words, that would be sort of the legacy. Godless means the greatness ha'adam of man, the greatness of man. He would stress less divine penalties and the failure to live up to God's demands and more focusing on the greatness intrinsic in man and the greatness that all people could accomplish. And that's pro- pro- part of the reason why he had so many students that went in different directions because he wanted each of them to become the great person that they could be, not molding them into carbon copies of himself. Both Slavarka and Navardic functioned under extreme, extreme poverty. But unlike Navardic, the altar of Slavarka, as we mentioned, d- attempted to dignify the yeshiva student, to give them good dress, they should wear nice suits, and they should have a good, decent diet, and getting them, you know, getting them a good place to sleep with unpatched clothes, these were things that the altar really took very seriously. And um, this was part of his educational philosophy. In Rav Nassim Kamenetsky's work, The Making of a Godel, he writes, and this we've already noted, but he writes it, in, I think, a, just in a, an important depiction of the, of the Slabarka Yeshiva. So he writes here, and this is source number one, for any newcomer, the first noticeable characteristic of the Slabarka Yeshiva, a manifestation of Gavos Adam, again, that, that phrase, the greatness of man, was the student's fashion and etiquette. Instead of the tattered black coats, the plain and shabby clothing of a typical Yeshiva student of that era, Slabarka students wore crisp, Light-colored three-piece suits, stylish Hamburgs or tilted fedoras. Hygiene was also important, and students shaved instead of growing beards, or if they did grow beards, they kept them trim. Finkel wanted his students to feel ennobled in every way. So the point was this nobility of stature and looking at oneself as important and significant, building his students up. We have just just to give you a picture, the altar lived right in the yeshiva. He he was there and virtually never left Slabarka. He was there for 30 years, between 1876 and 1906. He not only studied with his students, he ate with them, he lived with them, he was always around. He always, you know, was available and he would keep a watchful eye on all of his students. And he was demanding. As I mentioned to you, he was very single focus on his approach, but those students who took to him and students that he felt understood his derech were, he demanded a lot from them.
many different, as we mentioned, many different types of students emerged out of this yeshiva. And he was in, encouraged that. He encouraged the students to find their own direction within the framework that he, that he, that he aligned for them. And one of the, one of the um, legacies of the Altar of Stavarka is this concept that they had before, and there were mashkichim in other yeshivos, in, in the Lajan, they had people, you know, vekkers, and people wake people up and looking to make sure no one's talking. But the Altar was sort of this personality that we today may call a mashkia, or we may look at them as the mashpia, or some sort of spiritual role that is beyond the Rosh Hashiva. It's more, more than just the Rosh Hashiva. This is the, fa- the sort of the personality of the altar had. He, he had a Rosh Hashiva that would give shir for many, many years with Moshe Mordechai Epstein, who was the well-respected um, Magid Shir and Rosh Hashiva of Slavadka. He was the Rosh Hashiva. The altar was, a, was a, sort of above him. They shared responsibilities, but the altar was really the one in charge. And he was this, this, this bigger than sort of bigger than life, larger than life figure that was, we maybe call him the, the mashkiach, but he was more than the mashkiach. But this concept of sort of this big personality above, you know, above the rest of the normal staff or the mahanhala of the yeshiva really begins seeing its uh, full light. We saw a little bit within in the altar of Kelm, but that was a smaller place with a focus on younger students. We really see it come to a fore with the altar of Slabarka. As I mentioned, we don't know much about the altar's expertise. Uh, he didn't write on any subject. He didn't have any chidushim on shas. He didn't write any manuscripts or any works of that nature. We have reports in Tenua Samusr by Rav Dov Katz, who we mentioned is one of the scholars of the Muslim movement, that he had an astonishing expertise, expertise in both Tanakh and in Agada. And we know that Rav Moshe Mordechai Epstein also said that he had his shas on his fingertips. But that's all we really know. We don't really have, he didn't develop in writing a system of thought. He do, didn't, uh, you know, write down his own lectures. He gave shmuzim, he gave talks, and these would be very, very unique. We'll talk a little bit about the shmuzim now, and we'll probably have to continue next um, session to, to fully finish the Slobodka school. Well, let's talk a little bit about the shmuzim. So it's, it was often that on, the, on Shabbos, the Alta would give shmuzim, he would give an ethical discourse. And especially during Elul, people would come from far and wide to hear the altar. At times, when he would speak of spiritual delights, the students would, would, would record that he, we, they sensed that tears would come out of his eyes, not tears of melancholy, because that would be criticized by the altar, but rather they were tears of the heart, a depth of thinking, a clarity of ideas, which evoked passion and tears. And he would often have to bite his lip to stop himself from crying in order for him to get a hold of himself. And sometimes he would have to end the lecture early. Some of the, uh, some of the topics and the style are, are very uh, instructive. So he would give, a, this is, I found this is, a, the source that I used for many, much of this is um, Jonathan Rosenblum has a work called Reb Yaakov, where it's an, a biography, an article biography, where he interviews different students in the, in the, uh, from the Slovakia Yeshiva, including Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky himself. So many, much of this came from him. There's also a historical work by Tikachinsky. And Simcha Willig, as I mentioned, wrote a PhD dissertation on the altar of Slavadka. So those are my main sources. So this comes from, um, from those places. The altar gave a schmooze twice a week, ranging from 30 minutes to an hour. Though a summary of their contents might take no more than five minutes, the altar was able to keep his audience transfixed throughout. The way that he would give the, sh- the schmooze is he would say a few words and then pause. Then he would go on letting the message sink in. So we would say, you know, the world is a puzzle. And he would just pause. And then he would continue. And he would say pieces of ideas, not not clearly connected. That's why it's very difficult to study the schmuzen because the the ideas, although there's somewhat of a, we're going to do one together next time, we know there, we'll do a piece from uh, the Orat Safun, but, um, they're, they're, they're difficult to study. And that's because, first of all, he spoke that way. And second, there are these there are the recordings. They're, they're written down by the students. 
he would also speak in a monotone with not modulation, not much modulation. We, we know this also about Rav Yeruch and Lubavitz. We hear these great ethical discourses and we think they were these master you know, uh, speakers. The truth of the matter is that they specifically tone down the voice in order for people to have to listen, to pay attention. Tikachinsky writes that the reason why he would say these sort of disjointed ideas was he wanted to encourage his students to put the ideas together themselves. It was almost like an exercise of an educational uh, approach. As we mentioned, the, the altar was this ultimate pedagogue. He was this, his essence itself, his, his shmuzim were there as an exercise in a pe pedagogical uh, exercise. It, it was teaching them how to think. Not only was it teaching a message in its content, but in its methodology itself. And there's a term in educational, um, in the educational world out there, I don't know what to call it, the, uh, in, this, in the study of, this, of, of the methodology of education, there's a term that they describe sort of this paradigm between the guide on the side versus the, sta the sage on the stage. You have a sage on the stage approach, which is I'm going to tell you the lecture and you listen to me. And it's just this frontal sort of, you know, I know the information imparting it to you. This, the guide on the side is what the author was trying to accomplish when he would say these sort of these different disjointed ideas in the schmooz. He was trying to put together different ideas, but allow his students to really formulate the, the full thought. And therefore he was trying to facilitate their thinking rather than controlling or influencing or indoctrinating them. He would often use um, rhetorical questions and imagery to make a point. So we would read a chazal, we read a statement of our sages, and it would say, is it possible? Oh, in a well-known piece in, I think this is in the, um, the Chavetz Chaim, Rosh Hashiva, which the Chavetz Chaim, again, as I mentioned before, David Leibowitz was a student of the altar of Slobodka, and he founded the Shiva's Chavetz Chaim, and his son of Henech Leibowitz was a, many, many years of the Rosh Hashiva of Chavetz Chaim. They see themselves sort of as carrying on the Slobodka Masora. So a very famous teaching, I'll just share with you the brief idea here, is it says that Moshe Rabbeinu, Chazal tells Moshe Rabbeinu put both of his hands on Yehoshua when he gave smicha. And Chazal say to show you that he had no qualms or no jealousy uh, for his student because any Rebbe has, you know, any Rebbe, any teacher doesn't have any jealousy about his students. So the, the, the approach in Musr, the way they would teach it, they would say, is that, is that possible? Is it possible that Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest man, the 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 the, Adam, the person who is humble beyond any other other person, he would have jealousy over his students? What does this even mean? And then they would always, not always, but this is a very typical uh, Musr answer. Yes. Yes, it's possible. Jealousy is so powerful that even Moshe Rabbeinu, had he not been put those both of those hands to demonstrate that he had no jealousy and we saw that, there would have been a, at his level a, a, a piece of jealousy, and we see how 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 you know insidious and how strong the powers of Midos and the negative. You know, that's, that's sort of that typical the rhetorical question and just reading it and sort of asking it, and then the answer is yes. We see that's the case. Um, so, and then you know similarly, is it, why did the Torah need to obligate us not to kill? Right, last week's parsha, Lo Terza. We don't need the Torah for that. It's obvious. Those were the type of questions he would try to level the students to sort of just make them think and try to encourage them to question those uh, those those uh, teachings and to formulate their own thoughts. Source number two, another piece of the pedagogical approach was really that he was more than a teacher. He was, more, it was, it was, he was a father. And many students, this is from Rav Mordechai Shulman in an interview with Rav Jonathan Rosenblum. He says this explicitly, that he was more of a father than a teacher. And it was said, Rabbi Yosef Elias once asked Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky if a Rebbe must attend all of his students' weddings. So Rabbi Elias was a machanach, um, a big machanach. He translated actually the 19 letters, new translation in the 90s. He asked Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, Rabbi Yaakov was, again, from that world of Slobodka, and he asked him, does a Rebbe, does a teacher have to go to the weddings of his students? So Rabbi Yaakov responds, echoes the approach of the altar. Again, this is from Jonathan Rosenblum. A Rebbe is a father. Have you ever seen a father not present at a son's wedding? 
So again, this idea that that he lived with the Talmudim, the altar lived there. He 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 ate with them. He learned with them. He he was literally not, you know, he didn't leave the yeshiva for thirty years. And he saw all the students as brothers, and he as the father. I want to. Uh, we have more to discuss. Not so much more on Sabarka. We'll do. We'll do next week. We'll do. We'll start off with Sabarka. We'll move on. We'll move into contemporary Bali Musa or Volbi, one of my Rebbeim, Rebbeim Leichter, who I had the privilege of attending many of his Vadim over a few years in Israel. And then I want to show you how the debate continues, even to this very day, about the focus on you know external, uh, not external, additional curriculum to Gemara, and uh, and the debate continues, and I will see you, God willing, on February third, Thursday at eight thirty. I apologize for the changing of uh, the, the the times, but. Um, but that's uh, I appreciate Elaine helping me to organize that. Thank you everyone for coming, um, and thank you for bearing with us. And I'm really excited for the the next, the final episode of this lecture series. Thank you, Rabbi Lasher. Lila Tov. Yashikar. Yashikar. Thank you. Well, thank you. well presented. Oh, thank.